for the first time, we're going to be uh, uh, able to offer uh, services uh, aimed at uh, measuring HIV neutralizing activities. And again, this is the laboratory of David Montefiore, who uh, uh, we always have trouble finding external referees to David, especially for promotions and things like that, because they can't be collaborators. And I think he's collaborated with everybody in the world. So uh, uh, again, this is a world-class laboratory. Uh, David is still recuperating from a broken foot. Uh, and we won't go into how he broke his foot, but it was fairly inglorious. Uh, but he has designated uh, Celia the Branch to kind of give us an overview of the type of neutralization assay services they'll be offering. Thanks, Kent. David's really sad that he's not here today, um, mostly because he broke his foot and he's really uncomfortable. But um, I'd like to go over just a little bit of what we do, and I think probably over half of the people in this room know our lab and what we do, but for those of you who don't, and maybe for some of you who do, there's a lot more that goes on in our lab than just running the assays. So I wanted to start off with um, what the, really the components of the Neutralizing Antibody Core Program are. And first off, um, we have to actually get the envelopes or the virus constructs and make the viruses, and that's our molecular virology course. So we get um, envelopes and clone viruses uh, or isolates from all over the world, and they have to be uh, grown, sequence confirmed, plasmids have to be extant, expanded. We also, uh, in our laboratory, to a limited extent, make mutant viruses uh, for mapping and characterization of monoclonal and polyclonal neutralizing antibodies as it relates to various programs. Um, we have a virus core that is charged with producing, in a GCLP-compliant fashion, all of these different isolates. Um, but we make uh, pseudoviruses, we make infectious molecularly cloned viruses, we make infectious molecularly cloned reporter viruses, we grow and characterize uncloned virus isolates in swarms. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that goes on, and it's all done in a very careful fashion, because once a virus is grown and it's in a tube, it doesn't say, oh, my name is... So we have to know what's in that tube, and, and this is very important. We have over 500 isolates of HIV-1, all major subtypes and CRFs from a wide geographic representation. We have a limited number of HIV-2s in our library. We have a growing panel of SIVs from many different uh, species, many different strains, uh, and we're working on characterizing those. We also have all the major challenge stocks of SHIVs, uh, which is sort of the next uh, developmental vaccine model in non-human primates. And we also have many developmental stocks of, of those shivs. Then what most people are, are familiar with is our assay core, and then we have a small army of very talented people who run assays in a variety of cell lines. Our workhorse assays are TZMBL and A3R5. I'll uh, describe those for you briefly. We also have TZMBL cells that were um, stably transduced with FC gamma receptors by Gabe Perez in the lab um, that are useful um, for uh, detecting um, neutralizing neutralization by uh, different subtypes of, of immunoglobulin. We also have M7 Lux cells and, and CM and KRCCR5 Lux cells that have internal reporters like the TZMBL, but they are um, T cell based lines. And uh, we we do on occasion uh, do assays in PBMCs, although the variability in the assays with PBMCs makes the data very difficult to interpret in many cases. The TZMBL and A3R5 assays are formally optimized and validated, and that's been a huge uh, effort on the part of our lab in conjunction with our quality assurance unit that Marcella will talk about later. Um, we also, in our assay core, uh, do a limited number of ELISAs on a research uh, basis. We do um, 96 well-coded plates. We also have, uh, on a research scale, um, a MagPix Luminex-style um, multiplex uh, assay um, that we're developing. Also in our toolbox, we have a, a large variety of reference reagents, and these are, these are huge tools for us. We have uh, serum samples, uh, carefully uh, qualified and calibrated um, clade-specific um, sets of serum from chronically infected individuals that we use to help characterize the virus stocks that we have. We also have purified immunoglobulins uh, called HIVIG for clade B and clade C. We have um, stocks of 
many, many, many monoclonals that we've gotten from around um, the world, uh, many from here at Duke. Uh, Chavi's generating very interesting monoclonal antibodies all the time. You will have seen some posters uh, about this during uh, the poster session this morning. Um, we have many that are mapped, many that we are mapping or helping to map, uh, broadly neutralizing strain specific, um, but they're, they really help us in characterizing the uh, neutralizing antibody response that are generated in infected individuals and in um, vaccinated individuals. We also have libraries of peptides and libraries of uh, proteins that we use for mapping purposes, um, neutralization inhibition assays um, to help with mapping monoclonal and polyclonal responses. All of our um, laboratory is at least, to some extent, GCLP compliant. We do um, a lot of work with human clinical trials, which requires GCLP compliance. Uh, and, and most of the rest of our assays are done in, in a GCLP compliant fashion, even if they don't need to. So we have standard operating procedures for just about everything we do in the lab. There are checklists that the operators fill out as they're doing the assay so that there's a paper trail and every, every action is, is documented. We also undergo audits uh, routinely by our, our quality assurance unit. All of our equipment is, is monitored daily, weekly, monthly, you know, according to schedule. We have uh, competency and proficiency testing that we uh, do inside our lab, and we also offer to other labs who do these assays around the world. We also have databases where all of our serologic samples are categorized. And those of you that have sent us samples, you've gotten the specimen shipment form where we ask you to list every sample that you send us. That's very important. Every sample is listed in the database in its individual form. So it's very important that we be able to keep track of that because we get samples from everywhere. Uh, we also have databases for our viruses, for all of our plasmids. And we've just started... Um, amassing a positive control database. So in every assay that we run, we run a positive control. It used to be HIVIG or HIVIG-C. Now we have a monoclonal antibody uh, cocktail that's broadly neutralizing. It's run in every assay. And so that de value for the virus that it's run against is now compared with every value that's been run uh, with that virus antibody pair um, for the last several years. We've gone back and done this retrospectively. It's a huge value, valuable tool. Um, we also have, as part of our GCLP, the quality assurance unit that um, Marcella will talk about. So this is just a phylogenetic tree of the, the virus isolates that we have, emphasizing that we have all the major strains represented. Most of them are clade C, which is the biggest population of the pandemic, but we have um, the CRFs, we have um, the North American uh, clade. We have... Um, Many the, a new global reference panel that I'll talk about at the end, and, and you'll see that those are uh, represented all over uh, the phylogenetic tree, um, but there are a lot of isolates available for use. Another thing that we've done in our lab is to um, shed some light on uh, neutralization sensitivity of the different viruses. So back in the day when I started with HIV, there were the lab-adapted strains, and they were extremely neutralization sensitive. And then you'd have the primary isolates, which were not neutralization sensitive. And so what um, David's lab has done over the years is, is to understand um, through experience that there are neutralization sensitive viruses that are primary isolates that are, we call tier one, um, and, and that it's a continuum through the neutralization resistant viruses, which we call tier two. So, so there are neutralization sensitive viruses and neutralization resistance vi resistant viruses. And you'll hear those talked about and see them in the literature referred to as tier one and tier two. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to point out sort of in this introduction is um, that our lab um, is funded by several sources um, to do neutralizing antibody assays for particular projects. And it used to be that we could say, oh, yeah, we'll fit you in. Yeah, we can do, we can do your assays. And in the current climate of accountability, that is becoming less and less of an option. And so um, our... It's our pleasure to be part of the CIFAR core so that we can offer assays on a fee-for-service basis to individuals who need them for a one-off experiment or as part of um, 
generating preliminary data for um, a application for for bigger funding um, because um, you know we we are accountable to our funders um, and and hopefully the data that you get and will allow you to get bigger funding that will allow you to come back and use our services under the context of one of these larger funding sources. So we have the, we are the primate central immunology laboratory for the NIH. That's our major source of funding. And we do neutralizing antibody assays for NIH sponsored non-human primate vaccine studies and vaccine studies in other species. We also are, are charged by them to characterize monoclonal antibodies and broadly neutralizing antibodies. And we also do um, some characterization of um, broadly neutralizing antibodies that are being grown in plants for passive transfer um, studies. We, David also has a consortium for AIDS vaccine discovery through the Gates Foundation. And he is the neutralizing antibody core for all of their other CAVDs around the world. And, and also for the approved third-party studies, the non-CAVD people that apply to the Gates Foundation for, um, for um, neutralizing antibody uh, assays. We also do the neutralizing antibody work for the HIV vaccine trials network from the NIH. We also have uh, a small amount of funding from Chavi ID here at, uh, at Duke. And uh, we do occasionally have corporate contracts when they come to us with vaccine study plans where they need neutralizing antibodies. We work out a, a Duke corporate um, contract and are able to do um, assays that way. We have two standard validated assays, and I can see the, the chair standing up, so I think I'm over time. Uh, the TZMBL and the A3R5 assay. Um, the TZMBL is a HeLa uh, assay. It has an internal reporter. We can use a lot of pseudotype viruses. These cells are very sensitive to virus infection, and the neutralizing antibody assay is quick, relatively cheap, and highly robust, but it's not a a standard cell line, not an HIV infectable cell line in vivo. So we've developed uh, through a collaboration uh, the A3R5 assay, which has lower levels of CD4 and CCR5. It's a little harder to infect, but doesn't have an integral reporter, requires an, an IMC LUCR reporter virus. Um, the benefit of the latter assay is that it's much more sensitive um, to detection of tier two neutralization than the TZMBL assay. And that's shown here with data from a particular individual who was vaccinated with uh, a GP120. This is the detection of, of neutralization of this particular tier two clade B virus in TZMBL. And you can see the, the increase in sensitivity of detection of neutralization of that virus in the A3R5 assay. So we have these two assays that are readily available. One's easy, excuse me, easier, quicker, more robust. The other one is a little more expensive, takes a little bit longer, but it's more sensitive for tier two neutralization. Um, the other thing that these, the A3R5 assay has allowed us to do, because it's more sensitive, is to detect um, broadly neutralizing uh, antibody responses in vaccinated individuals. So this is another individual that was vaccinated with a GP120 protein. And because we can look for um, cross-clade uh, and intra-subtype um, heterologous neutralization, we could see that this particular individual uh, developed the ability to uh, neutralize a wide variety of um, clade B and clade C isolates despite being vaccinated with a single reference strain. Um, this is a, a new global panel of reference strains. This is a sort of a research project collaboration between David's lab and Betty Korber at Los Alamos to uh, see if we can, instead of testing the big panel of of 500 viruses or 100 viruses to determine breadth, is there a smaller subset of viruses that you could interrogate um, that would actually give you the, picture, the same picture of neutralization sensitivity that the, the larger panel does? And so um, Betty and her team of statisticians identified through the neutralization serotype discovery program, which was 200 viruses and 200 non-matched uh, serum donors, um, these nine isolates uh, reflected the ability of a given serum to neutralize the broader panel of viruses. So going forward, and this is a relatively new thing in our lab, going forward, this will be our first point of call 
uh, for looking at uh, neutralization uh, responses developed uh, in response to vaccines. Um, and this uh, 3D reconstruction was basically just to um, point out that there are um, epitopes for broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been uh, discovered and antibodies that recognize those. We have all of these antibodies and have the ability to detect uh, specificities to all of these different broadly neutralizing epitopes uh, through competition with the, uh, the broadly neutralizing monoclonals and through a growing panel of HIV mutant envelopes that we're developing in the lab. And the contact information, I think, is also in the reference, and I'll stop there. Thank you.